Hey, what's going on? So today's video, I'm gonna be a little lighthearted today. I'm just picking, so don't take it personal. Anybody that's an atheist or anyone else listening. So with number five here, we got that only God can judge me. So biblically speaking, this is incorrect. And this is what happens when people um, learn their scripture by memes or from Reddit or YouTube, and they don't actually open the Bible themselves. So Jesus does say that only God can judge. And most people in the back of their mind are thinking about the uh, famous scene where, or the story where Jesus is uh, approaches the woman who's been committing adultery and says, everyone put your stone down. He who has no sin cast the first stone. And people want to try to interpret that as, you know, I can basically live any way I want. Nobody can tell me you know, what's right or wrong, because God's going to do the judging in the very end. Well, that's true. But um, as we read in the book of Matthew, we're supposed to keep our brothers and sisters accountable. Um, and we're supposed to use God's word for that. All of Paul's, almost all of Paul's letters addresses churches for their, um, for stepping out of line. And that's what we're supposed to do. And by the way, that a church is where two or more are gathered. So it doesn't necessarily mean a building where people can go in is the entire body because the two or more are gathered right that's what jesus said but um a, a key thing people miss here is that when jesus says that um only god can judge me or only god can judge you and he tells everyone to put the the stone down that's also um symbolism of jesus claiming his deity that he is the judge that he, he is eternally existed with the father he is the son of god and he sits at the right hand of the throne of the Father and will judge us. So it's not, the scripture is not saying that, hey, you know, I can live any way I want. And it's okay because God's going to judge me at the end. And Christians need to butt out. That's not what it's saying. He's claiming his deity and his power and his majesty and his righteousness and how he will judge on the throne and how we will all go before him one day. So that's completely taken out of context. Doesn't mean you can just live any way you want. And food for thought. Um, I would much rather have a a be judged by a human court or you know with 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 man and humanity, mankind. I mean, we we make errors. People get off on crimes all the time. They have better lawyers or they have good you know defense attorneys. They spend a lot of money. People get out of get out of a committing crimes all the time you know no, no judicial system is perfect um, but <laughs> think about it. the all-knowing all-seeing all-powerful God being of Yahweh you think you're gonna get something past him you're not so just saying hey only God can judge me I think that people would be actually if you actually thought about it It'd be more comfortable with being judged by people because we're going to make mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. He knows your heart. Not only does he know your actions, he knows your heart. And, you know, that's how we're going to be judged. So, you know, he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. He made it harder. But that's the whole reason why we need his blood that was spilt on a cross. All right, number four, we got you're only a Christian because where you live. So the undertone is, is that, you know, you're a Christian because or you have a relationship with Jesus because that's where you're raised or you live in America or you live in a, a Christian dominated country. So it's really you're just a product of where you live. OK, so first, um, let's really think about this for a second. So the spread of Christianity in the uh, middle to the first century, whenever Christianity was re highly recognized by you know the Romans and the Jews as a messianic cult, and you know they didn't worship Jesus, they didn't believe in Jesus, so it was seen as a cult, you know, and uh, it spread from that part in that time of the world where Christians were highly persecuted, where they were being hunted down. It wasn't like you you walked down the street and saw a church with a cross on the top and a guy coming out with uh, smoke and, you know, got an arrow, an arrow uh, with a little teenager holding up a sign on the end of the gravel road saying, turn in here with your baggage and carry 
and come worship the uh, risen Messiah. Okay, Christianity, Christians were highly persecuted. They were hunted down. All the apostles were hunted down. All of them were martyred besides John. He, what, died on an island probably, of starvation, something of that nature on Patmos. So, you know, Christian, early uh, first century Christians like Polycarp and Ignatius, they were hunted down as well. They write about it in their letters. So the early church was highly persecuted. They were fed to lions. They were thrown in gladiator gladiatorial pits. You know, Christianity was seen as um, illegal. And another food for thought on that is that think about all these other pagan religions that were going around in the time. And Christianity was a was a very it still is a very peaceful faith. And but the government wanted to wipe it out for some reason. You know, why do you think that is? Maybe it's because they witnessed some miraculous things that Jesus did. And they saw some miraculous things that the early church did, like in the book of Acts. You know, we can read about some historical context on that, and that's for another video another time. But we actually have writings from um, non-Christian sources talking about some miraculous things that that, quote, Jesus guy did. But anyway, so that, you know, that would easily throw up an alarm or a bell um, into a government's mind. They don't want their people um, following this this new cult that means everyone's the same. That we're all treated equal. We're all the same, Greek or Jew or Gentile, free or slave, man and woman. You know, that that was uh, that was not a popular opinion at that time. But Christianity spread, and and under that type of historical context, through those trials and tribulations, it spread. Okay, you read in the book of Acts, they had to have, um, uh, they had churches in people's houses and stuff in, in, in hiding. And lo and behold, we also have an example like that today in China. I think that we're all pretty familiar with the, the type of um, atrocities and the type of uh, pressure that the Chinese government, the Atheist Communist Party, puts on its people. But Christianity today, we're... Christians are persecuted today in China. So 2020, this applies in 2020 as well, as well. It's the fastest growing religion in China. And it's not even close. Some people estimated it to be nearly 100 million Chinese people are coming to the faith. Easily the fastest growing religion in China. And they have underground churches and underground Bible studies. So even today, the persecution of a, of a powerful government like China... China's no, you know, third world country. You know, they're pretty powerful, pretty strong country. And even through their persecution, like Rome, who was the most powerful, still can't stop what the Holy Spirit wants to do. So Holy Spirit's going to turn people's hearts of stone to hearts of flesh, no matter what you do. You can't prevent, you can't stop the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to lead people to the blood of Christ and no government and no other faction on this planet can stop that. So does it help to be born in a in a in a place where there's, you know, you're not being hunted down and chased? Of course. But that's not the only reason. We have the very first uh, early church that went through persecution and Christianity spread to the biggest religion in the world like it is today. And we have the biggest country in the world with a uh, communist atheist dictatorship and Christianity is still spreading there faster than any other religion. And... Some people predict that it's going to overtake Buddhism in the next decade, decade and a half. And Buddhism is right around 200 million people. So can't stop what God wants to do. Well, we have another example here of the diploma that Reddit hands out to people who don't want to do any of the research themselves. Um, this is so far and away from the truth that I don't even know how anyone can come up with this, but I've heard it from time to time and I hear it or read it, excuse me, on social media. So let's just go ahead and address it. And that's the Bible is mistranslated, ever played telephone as a kid. So I know y'all have heard it before where you, you know, you have all these kids sit in a circle and they play and you tell them a long story. And by the end of the at, at time, it gets to the last kid then the story is completely different than what was originally told so they use that as an example of the mistranslation of the bible okay all right first and foremost um we have over 5400 copies and papyri of the new testament 
okay, from the first to the seventh century, all right, of the Greek manuscripts of the Bible, okay, and it was a free transmission of the text. Now, what does that mean? A free transmission of the text means that there were several different branches that went throughout the Middle East and Northern Africa, and the reason why they find those manuscripts in that part of the world today because it's a dry uh, climate, so it kind of preserves it a little better than it would if you left a papyri in the middle of a jungle, right? Where it's a lot of moisture or in Florida or Louisiana, something like that. So the manuscripts have roots and other manuscripts that run from it. So you have all these different manuscripts that equal about 5,400 copies of the New Testament and no one ever had all the papyris at one time. So all the papyris were scattered about. So there, there is, you can compare all the manuscripts to them. Okay, so it never went from one source. If all the manuscripts and the scripture was in one place at one time, then one person could change, and then we would have from the first century, first, second century, and then we would have whatever that person changed it to read whatever that person wanted it to read. But since so many copies, particularly the book of Matthew, which was the most popular gospel in the first century, we have so many copies of Matthew that spread out. We can compare all these other copies of Matthew to each other and we can come to a conclusion to what the original signature, what the original gospel of Matthew wrote. Also, we have early church fathers, early first and second century Christians who quoted, we'll use the book of Matthew again, who quoted the book of Matthew. So we can compare what they wrote compared to the copies that we have. So you have all these different sources that were never under the control of one person at one time and that's how the manuscripts and that's how and that's how the bible is put together today and another food for thought comparing children to a telephone game to how the transmission of the text occurred is is ridiculous as well because it only went from greek to english okay so now we did have the early latin so the latin vulgate was one of the earliest church uh bibles Okay, so, but we still have the Greek manuscripts which predate that. So when you read the NASB or the ESV or the NLT, these Bibles were written with the accumulation of all these Greek papyries. And you have people who know and study language. I'm studying language myself. It's a very tough, very strenuous religion. But it definitely, when you read it through those, that lens, it gives a very clear picture into what you know the the uh, the deity of Christ and the 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 pro uh, the verbs where the Holy Spirit um, has verbs where it applies to His action. So He's not a force. He's He's actually doing thing under His control and His and His mind and His power. So and then and then on top of that, these are biblical scholars. Like Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. He was very educated. Paul was one of the most educated Jews at the time when he wrote all of his epistles and all of his letters and. 1 Corinthians and all that, and James was the brother of Jesus who he thought was crazy, okay, before he, um, you know, obviously he changed his mind after he saw the risen Christ, he saw his brother that was risen. So, but these are the, you know, independent sources that we have that are writing these things. These aren't children sitting in a corner passing a story around. You had educated people who, were, who knew the time, who knew the language, who addressed certain people like all the gospels address the Jews or they, they address uh, the Greeks or they address Romans. They address different types of people. So they knew their audience. They had an educated background. They had one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction with Jesus Christ, like James, like Paul, who met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And they had a high education of the Old Testament. That's why they quote the Old Testament throughout the entire New Testament. These people were very smart, very sharp. It wasn't a bunch of six-year-old kids sitting in a circle telling a story. All right, so the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, is pro-slavery, anti-woman, full of genocide, other moral atrocities done by God. This is a common atheist argument that we're going to tackle here now, this one can go a lot more detail and a lot deeper. I'm trying to make this video, you know, each clip, each number, a couple of minutes. So we're going to do the best I can. So the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, is pro-slavery. 
Well, no, it's not. The Bible says that anybody who captures somebody and puts them into slavery, that person who captures them should be put to death. There are different types of slavery. When we automatically think of slavery, we think of American slavery where people were captured and they were forced to do work and labor. And food for thought real quick, uh, even the Apostle Paul and the Book of Jude all start off their their books calling themselves uh, slaves for Christ or a bond servant. That's another term for it. The Greek word is doulos. The Bible does say that you are to treat your bond servants and slaves with respect and love after a, say, for instance, after a war. And there's a reason for that. Particularly the women, once a country was taken over, the women and the children could not fend and take care of themselves. So God ordered the people to that did take over that land to take care of the families so they wouldn't die out in the desert or, or anywhere else. Starve to death. Also, people wanted to uh, get out of a certain hardship from a, a country or a land where they were being oppressed and they would meet people of God and they had to pay off their indentural servitudes. So that's how the Old Testament treated slavery. Obviously, this can get a lot deeper um, and I'll, maybe I'll make a video just focusing on that. So obviously read the Old Testament in its historical context, not through the lens of a woke 2020 Twitter glasses. Anti-woman, this one's really funny. Um, women were the ones who discovered Jesus who resurrected from and left the tomb, not men. The men were the ones who ran off. Jesus on his cross told followers to behold his mother, Mary at that time. God used Deborah in the Old Testament to slay a Canaanite king. So God used judgment on a pagan religion and a pagan king and had a woman take him over. And that king was eventually led to a tent and hit over the head with a rock by another woman. Paul writes, and I mentioned this earlier, neither Greek nor Jew nor Gentile, man, free, slave, were all one under Christ. Jesus Christ views us all the same. We're all sinners. Man's not more important than female. Female's not important than male. And Paul writes about this in the book of Galatians. Okay, so, and we're all the same, meaning that we're all sinners and we all need a savior. Every person who's ever lived needs Jesus Christ's blood. Um, and I do have a video called Strong Women in the Bible in my library where it goes in more depth in this if you'd like to watch it. Now let's go over the genocide. Okay, so the genocide and other moral atrocities done by God. So another popular argument is that the Old Testament is, uh, you know, God, Jehovah, Yahweh. He's um, pretty aggressive. He's, he's a lot different in the Old Testament than he is through his incarnate son, Jesus Christ. But before I go on to this, let's, let's do another food for thought. So time after time, I didn't put this one as an argument because it's so overplayed, but just why is there evil in the world? Okay, so, but here's an example where God punishes evil, and I, I, I just talked about Canaanites a second ago. So they worshiped a, a giant statue looking bull named Baal. So, and what it was was this, like this iron cast iron bull, and you would open them up and you would shovel, uh, you know, coal and wood in there, and you'd heat them up, and his hands were out like a, like a table, and it would heat up so much, people would set babies on the hands. And it would fry the babies. Okay, and I believe it was a, uh, a Greek historian named Plutarch wrote about it where they would try to drown out the baby screaming with drums. So we have an example here where God is punishing evil. He, the Canaanites were evil. God is punishing them through war and famine and death and destruction in the Old Testament. So when God punishes evil, People say, hey, why is God like this moral monster in the Old Testament? And then when there is evil in the world and nothing's done, then people say, well, why does God allow that? It's like, you know, he can't win. There are many books written on this. Is God a moral monster in the Old Testament? And all this, and this has been refuted over and over and over again. This just gets popular when people watch and get on social media and they don't do any of the background themselves. Because like any historical document you have to read who wrote it who they were writing to the historical context of the writing that is extremely important and i will do a video on this and get much more in depth i haven't done one on this but i will now one more food for thought on this on number two here is that 
and I'm speaking to my atheist friends here because I have plenty and I love them very much and I pray for them. But here, here's what I'm saying is that what is the moral objective standard that they are measuring God? So where, where do they get their standard in the Old Testament? Where does it come from? If they're, if we're all just, um, if we're all just, you know, talking monkeys, if we're all just moist machines, if we're all just an amoeba that turned into a human being over 4.6 billion years, then what does it matter if there are atrocities? There is no objective moral standard. There is no right or wrong. Your little uh, wrinkly grandmother who knitted you a sweater has the same fate as Adolf Hitler or Pol Pot or Stalin or any of these other horrible people that lived in the past. You just go to the grave. You just get buried and you get eaten by the worms. There is no righteous judgment. So where, where, where is this righteousness coming from? Where where did, Where is your standard? Now, I've had to tell my, my buddies this time before, my atheist friends time before, I'm not saying that the Bible gives you and tells you what is objectively moral, right or wrong. The Bible actually says that it's written in your heart. But our standard is Jesus Christ because he was perfect and he died and rose again for all sins of man. So that is our objective moral standard. If an atheist or an agnostic is using their own, what they feel is right at that time or what popular opinion in a culture is at that right at the time. I mean, at one point in time in America, it was seen legal to uh, have slaves. Was it, was it uh, objectively morally right at that point in time because the vast majority of people felt that that was okay? Or how about capturing Jews and throwing them in ovens in, in Germany in the, in the 30s and 40s? Was that okay because there was an objective or because there was a standard at that time that society picked? Or do we have an outside source and objective standard? I believe we do, and I think we all know the answer.